do our confession together this morning before we sit down. So let's say it together. I am here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open. My mind is ready to receive because God is not finished with me yet. My best days are right in front of me. I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. Amen. Amen. Well, you can give God praise, turn up the lights, and uh, you can be seated. Hallelujah. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Everybody say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And say this, I have more than enough for every good work that God gives me. And you know, it's a good work to take care of your family, to take care of situations and circumstances with friends. Everybody say, I have more than enough. We have more than enough to do whatever God's given us to do. Today, we're going to be talking about where the rubber meets the road. And, uh, you know, when I first heard this, I thought, oh, you know, sometimes um, I was a teenage driver. You know, I was the one that took driver's education. And they said, somebody in here within a few months will have an accident. I thought, that's not me because I'm so such a safe driver. But I was dating a guy, or I wasn't dating. My friend was dating a guy that I had dated that in the ultimately turned out to be uh, my husband. And uh, <clears throat> she was dating him, and so we were all in this car together. I decided to take them on a little ride in the country. And uh, it was a place where, you know, when, you go, when you're young, you go out and park in the country so you can kiss and snuggle up and all that. So I thought, I will just drive him right by that place, you know, remind him of that. Well, he's in the, <laughs> yeah, these are my teenage years, folks. You know, I'm like a, uh, I'm a junior in high school. I've just got my license. So I'm going out through this country. Well, I had never driven there, and I didn't realize it was gravel. Uh, and when I came up over this hill, it was a T, and there was a church sitting up there. Slammed on the brakes. The car started spinning, you know, like it got out of control. Uh, you know, in water, that would be hydroplaning, but on gravel, you just you just are going and going till I finally spun around, hit a bush on the other side of the road, and uh, the guy that I married is in the back seat. He's got salad dressing dripping down his face, <laughs> and he's screaming, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. I thought, well, that just serves you right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, that was not a very smart thing to do. In fact, my girlfriend... She ended up with a broken sternum. Uh, the car was demolished. How many of you know when you get into doing things you shouldn't be doing, bad things can happen? And uh, where the rubber meets the road, I believe this message will be for a few weeks based on the fact, are you a hearer or a doer of the Word of God? Uh, where the rubber meets the road is not what you know, it's what you do. It's not how much I knew. I knew I shouldn't be doing that. But, you know, for a moment, my jealousy and envy and strife and every evil work ended up in a bad situation. I was watching a movie called 27 Dresses. I don't know if some of you ladies might have watched it. But she gets really mad in this automobile. And I want to show this video. Now, it may not be the best video, but listen for the words. I saw you mooning at him over Polenta. Of course you're upset. You're planning your sister's wedding to the man that you're in love with. You're stuck in this creepy little love triangle, and all the while you're about one monogram party made away from blowing your brains out. That is ridiculous. Oh, well, you can't tell her what they're nice saying, Jay, but they're fighting. Okay? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay? He's my boss. She's my sister. I am thrilled to be planning their wedding. Tickled even. I, like I have been for everybody that I've been a part of, but you can't understand that because you're you're mean. Crazy lady, we're going to hide 
hydro play. Slow down. We are knocking off hydro play. <laughs> well, you know how many do you know, how many do you know that we have situations like that in our lives, and then we start hydroplaning when we don't stay on the Word of God. You know that's what connects us to the power of God. That that's what connects us to safe ground. And so I want to start with James one uh, twenty two, but uh, I believe that we're in a world today that is hydroplaning. Uh, our, our nation is hydroplaning. They, they are not connected. Uh, the people that are making decisions in our nation who have great power are not, they are hydroplaning. They are not in any way connected to anything that's going to bring stability to this nation. And we can have that happen in our own lives. So as I was praying about this message, um, we, can, we can be hearers all day long of the word of God. But if we don't do it, this is what it says. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You know, a lot of times we think that it's because of something somebody else did or because of a situation that we ended up in the mess that we're in. But ultimately, we're responsible for what we know and what we do. Uh, we're responsible for our choices. And so when we make right choices, the word of God says that we will be blessed. When we make wrong choices, the word of God says that we put ourselves in an opportunity for the enemy to take advantage of us. Now, I thank God for all the times that he has not, uh, that he has rescued me in my stupidity. How, ma how many of you would say that too? And, uh, but sometimes, you know, I believe we really just push past that spot where we felt that word that God was saying of stop. Everybody say stop. You know, it's very hard to stop sometimes when you don't have an explanation. How many of you like an explanation of why? You know, it's like, tell me why. I lived on a road in, in my growing up days. It was Highway 25 in Logansport. Our house was right on the highway. Now, today we have interstates. That road is not busy at all. But when we grew up, it, there were semis. There were, I mean, this came straight down from South Bend, right up from, from Lake Michigan, up in that, you know, it was a heavily traveled road straight to Indianapolis. And so my mother, I mean, we were disciplined very heavily for getting on the other side of the sidewalk because the consequences of that, just us forgetting, just us walking out there could have meant that we wouldn't have been here anymore because there would be no way. This traffic was supposed to be slowed down, but right before my house, there was a big curve in the road, and they just come flying up over there. They hadn't been off the highway that long. So, you know, semis and, and people driving too fast would come flying by there. So the discipline we had to have in order to stay on the right side of the sidewalk was really uh, very severe, and that day, you did get switched. You know, I can remember my mother. We lived on a, in a house where if we knew we were in trouble, we'd run to the front yard because mother would be down below where nobody could see her saying, get down it, and she'd have that switch. And we'd say, no, we're not coming down there. Well, that didn't do much good. That just made it worse on the other end of the steps. But, uh, you know, w we were no worse the wearer for her being very very strong in the discipline if we crossed over that piece of ground. And God is not a severe God, but he is a God who means what he says. And so when we hear the word of God and we don't do it, you know, it may not be, there may not be a semi coming that day if we stepped into the street, but what day will there be a semi coming that would have taken us out had we stepped into the street? So for her, as a, a mom, as somebody who loved her children, uh, she was very strong in her discipline. Everybody say discipline. To remind us that that was a dangerous place to be. 
you know, that little accident there was no big deal. But if you're on the wrong road and do that at the wrong time, you know, if you're in Colorado in the mountains, that's going to be a disaster. You're going to be off the s side of a mountain. And I think in the world today, the decisions that we make every single day for us, for our children, uh, whether just like with Maddie going to school, I thank God for young people who can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit because we are living in a different day than when I was in school. When I was in situations where my mom wasn't there, I mean, I, I knew right from wrong, and, and it was a more protected environment. We weren't put in positions that young people are put in today. But even myself, in, in driving places and making choices of which way I go, everybody say, it's critical. And so when you're a doer of the word, if the word says, don't do this, then if we do that, nobody is going to stop you from heaven, but the Holy Spirit in you is going to say, don't do it. And we'll keep repeating, don't do it until you've done it enough that you don't hear him anymore. How many of you know that's true in our lives? So when God says, be a doer of the word, and, and this is James, he was the brother of Jesus, and it says, be a doer of the word and not hearers only, dis, uh, de deceiving yourselves. To deceive is to cause, to accept, as true or valid, what is false and invalid. Well, we proved that in our last election because we elected someone who today is making decisions that are totally against the word of God. Now, I'm not saying we as believers did that, but it took believers to get that accomplished. So that means in the church, we need a wake-up call. We need a wake-up call. The Bible says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, or you will deceive yourself. And I was thinking the other day about things you watch on television, or I watch on television. And some things used to really bother me that I've found today, uh, they don't bother me as much as they used to. But if I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, I'd, I'd click it off. Our TV got on some channel. Probably my husband, Pastor Bill, he likes to check all the channels, you know, and we, he fell asleep in the middle of one he shouldn't have been on, I guess. So I come home and per turned it on, and I said, have you been watching this? He said, well, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> you know, I mean, he's asleep on the couch. And, and I, it was, there was stuff in that that I immediately clicked that off. But how many times are we in situations where we need to click it off or stop, and it's just kind of become the way it is? Well, I believe God's going to call us to a higher accountability for our own protection. Everybody say, for my protection. And so when, when you hear the Holy Spirit say something, you know, that seems strange to you, uh, like Hunter, you heard to homeschool your kids this year, you know, you probably weren't looking like to be a teacher this year. But when the Holy Spirit speaks, everybody say, when the Holy Spirit speaks, we listen. And so, you know, there's things that go together, like Isaiah 1 says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Everybody say, willing and obedient. And there's uh, through faith and patience, you inherit the, prom the promises. Well, you know, you can have faith, and you're walking by faith, but then you get impatient. And, and then we make a decision, or we, we change the way we're doing something to try to get to where we know we're going, but we get there faster. How many of you like to find the fastest route to wherever you're going? That's me. You can ask my husband. Well, then it says in Matthew, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, your house will be on sinking sand. But if you are a hearer and a doer of the word, your house will be on a strong foundation. And when the winds and the storms blow, you'll be okay. So I was reading the rest of James, and it says in verse 23, this is after being a doer of the word, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, everybody say the word of God, and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. You know, I looked over um, in James chapter 1. You know, we read that scripture. Everybody say wisdom. 
It says, uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know, the way God tests us is through, are we a doer of the word? That's the test. That is the test in everything. You know, it says, oh, no man, anything but to love him. But, but I want that new car today. And so I'm going to get it. But when I get done, I'm not only going to love men, but I'm also going to owe the bank. Now, I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. I have a lease on my car. But if we're not really able to do that, and we're doing something that we have a check, and it says don't go there, this is practical living. Everybody say practical living. <laughs> then we're going to put ourselves in a place where we're a hearer, but not a doer. Now, there have been times Pastor Bill and I used charge cards when we started this church. But in the midst of that, God gave us a plan to how to get out of debt. And today, of course, you know, my age is a lot further ahead than a lot of you. But we have no debt. We have no debt. And if my car, if something happened, I could pay off the car. I could pay off what I owe. Well, when they are in that position, then it's not really debt that you cannot take care of. Oh, no man. Everybody say, oh, no man. Anything but to love him. And, and so when God said that, he wasn't saying, I don't want you to have anything. I don't want you to have anything nice. I don't want your kids to have anything nice. I just want you to be poor. Now, listen, this is what a lot of the church believes. The church worldwide, that's what a lot of them believe. To have nothing is to prove that you're very spiritual. Everybody say, that's a lie. Abraham was one of the richest men ever in his time. So was Solomon. So was David. I mean, David had enough built up in his treasure chest to give for his son to build everything he was going to do for the temple. So God wants us to prosper. It's not that God doesn't want us to have anything. But when God says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and I will open the windows of heaven so that there's not room enough to contain. He's not saying that because he wants 10% of your money. He's saying that because he wants you to trust him for all your money. Because sometimes if you don't have a job, you're going to have to trust God for everything that we have. And uh, I learned that as a single mom. So when God says here, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, this is like you're becoming a hearer. Patience is the doer part. Let patience have its perfect work because it just said that, that a doer does the works, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How would you like to be in that state? Perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. With no, uh, and then it says, if you, any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, for he gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Everybody say doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable. Everybody say unstable in all his ways. Years ago, I did, a, right after we moved here, I don't know how I ended up in this because I really don't know anybody in Michigan, but they contacted me and asked me to do a women's meeting with another lady in Michigan. So I went, and uh, she was a very prophetic person and and so she stood up and she said the Lord has told me that in the last days the hardest thing to find will be a stable woman well right then I decided that's not going to be me but I I see today and if you look in second Timothy uh, chapter three I've never understood this I still don't understand it but I'm not I mean I'm, I don't question it it's in the word of God but it, it talks about in the last days, and I want to read this to you because how did we get here? This is how we got here. When the rubber met the road, it didn't meet. There were hearers without doers. And this is, this is what God said to me, and I, I've read this so many times. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Well, you know, my last days could have been back when I was a single mom. Uh, you know, perilous days can be any time when you're living in a world where the devil is still roaming about as a roaring lion. But I also believe we are in the last of those last days. And it says, for men will be lovers, 
listen to these things, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Then it says, from such people turn away, for of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins and led away by various lusts. And I thought, well, that's what that woman said in the last days. Do you know, I thank God for my husband, but I feel responsible as a woman, and this isn't a woman message today. I know there are men here, but... I mean, I see you, and, and I know God has a plan for you, but I believe women have totally abdicated where they belong in the spirit. Everybody say in the spirit. This has nothing to do whether you work or not. This has to do with is your mind, is your heart transfixed on the will of God for your family? And the word of God makes it very clear that we'll be doers, not hearers only. I can know all the world, all the word in the world, but if I'm not speaking that over my children as the mother of those children, then I'm not fulfilling my role in the kingdom of God. Now, does that mean they're going to do everything I say? Uh, no. Doesn't mean that. But it does mean there's words out there, words of life, words of power, words of anointing. I am a, not only a hearer, I am a doer of the word. And when I get in a situation, I've had to learn that more and more since I took this position and we came out here. I cannot say what I'd like to say. How many of you just, you know, you just like to say it? But, you know, for that little bit, the enemy's going to take advantage of that. And so I really had to get a guard over my mouth. So when it says that all these things are going to happen, God began to show me. All, my husband always asked me, what are you going to preach? I need to know if I need to come. And so we were on our ride, which we do on Saturday. And he said, uh, well, what is it? And uh, so I was telling him, I finally, I'm just preaching. I mean, I'm like in the car saying, and do you realize that da-da-da-da and da-da-da-da? And da? I was thinking of people that had started down this road. Well, you know, it's not going to hurt me to do this. It's not going to hurt me to do that. It's not going to hurt me to do this. And now I'm watching them go further and further and further down the road because they're deceiving themselves. Everybody say deceiving themselves. It's not because of their circumstances. It's not because they're in a bad place. It's not because they're hurting. It's because they, first of all, stopped being a doer of the word. And I believe that's why God is speaking this message to me, and you can take it for you too if you want. Then it says in James 1, because I know in my own life I get sloppy with my mouth. Now, maybe you guys don't. Maybe you all just... Say what you're supposed to say all the time. But, you know, the greater your responsibility, the greater your words are going to affect not just you, but other people. You know, I've said to the Lord before, why do I have to be the pastor? You know, if you just sit in the congregation, you do more things without getting caught. I mean, without God talking to you anyway about it. But the more you become a leader wherever you are, the more God is going to get a hold of you. And say, no, you, you can't say that. You, you, don't, you cannot do that. You, you don't have the uh, permission from me to speak those words. I need you speaking this. Well, you know, we have great authority over our children. So God's saying, speak what I speak. You know, and I've got some situations just like all of you, Pastor Bill and I do. And uh, sometimes, you know, Pastor Bill will say something and, and I'll have to correct him. And then sometimes I say something and then he corrects me. Because we know we cannot just flap our jaws about what we see. Because that will cause us to become deceived. And it produces a fruit out there that I don't really want to see. Just think about the things you've said maybe this morning or yesterday. And say, do I really want that? I mean, do I really think I can say that and get by with that? With the Holy Spirit in our house. It's a little hard. And this is what it says. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Everybody say temptation. You say, why are we in this book? Well, James, it says, um, is the kind of book you ought to read standing up. 
It contains a ringing call for action, a plea for vital Christianity, and a faith that demonstrates itself, not in mere words, but in lifestyle. James is one of the most practical books in the Bible, teaching that faith without corresponding action is dead. If James were leading an organization, you would hear you and you were his employee, you would feel the heat of this leader. He would motivate you with words like, don't tell me about your accomplishments, show me. The more you walk the walk, the less you have to talk. Let's put some shoe leather on those core values. And, and, and it is a very direct chapter if you read all of it. But this particular chapter one is talking about loving God under trials, it says in my Bible. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire, listen to this, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Everybody say, that's why we need to do the word. Because it doesn't, it's just like that frog they used to talk about, you put in a pot of hot water, turn the burner on, at first, they're, they're not jumping out, and pretty soon they just get warm. They just relax, and then they, they just get cooked. It's so, sin is so deceiving. I have people today that I talk to that I've known from Tulsa, people I've known here, and when I talk with them, I can tell by their words that their life is in the situation it's in because along the way, they stopped being a doer of the word. And I even felt like God said to me, you used to do da-da-da. You used to do da-da-da. And I'm thinking, well, why am I not still doing da-da-da? Well, you know, all of us get busy. There's things in this world. But I would ask you today, when you get home and you're with the Lord and you're in that time praying, Lord, are there things I need to start doing that I have let go? Things that I need to speak that I'm not speaking on a regular basis. I don't want to be deceived in the hour that I'm living in. If you listen to the news and things that have happened, even in the last few weeks in our nation, uh, I this happened when I was in Tulsa. A man I knew, he made a mistake. He made a mistake. Um, I think he was aware he made a mistake. He was a Christian. But at the time, he couldn't say, see any way to fix it. Now, when, when it got to that point, it, it really was hard to fix. I mean, I didn't even know what to say to help them. And, and, you know, I loved them. They were friends. But they were in a position that they didn't see an answer for. But they didn't get there that day. They got there way back there when they said, I feel like I should be doing this. Well, it's okay. You know, I'm still going to do da-da-da for the Lord, but I'm going to do this. And they, they just started moving away. Well, one day they went to to get their money, and they had none. The IRS took it right out of their account. Boom, gone. Just gone. And all their checks were bouncing. And the bank had no mercy because they had done something wrong, according to IRS. So they had all the checks bounced. They had the charges for the checks, and all their money was gone. They had to sell their house and take all the equity in it to get all that mess cleaned up. Not because that day... That, that, that thing happened. I watched along the way. Some of the things, I probably could have said something, but I didn't. And, you know, I had to ask God to forgive me if I was the one that should have said, I don't think that's, I don't think that's God. But how many of you know there are opportunities, if we're not in the word of God, like we need to be and being continually in our mind, renewed to the truth of the word of God, we are a sitting target for the enemy to pull, and you say, well, I'm not that important. Oh, yes, you are. If you're a believer, you have a testimony, and what he wants is your testimony. The devil comes for your testimony. He comes to show that God is not God. It's not you. It's who you represent.
Everybody say who I represent. And we represent the Lord. So this, uh, to remove yourself from discipline, it says, or from uh, these temptations, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, that's that anger we saw in that video where they were fighting in that car. Uh, you know, Pastor Bill and I have had fights in the car before. You know, that, that may be a shocker, but we've, we've had a few. Because that's when we talk about things. And sometimes, you know, we both think we're right. How, you probably don't do that. One of you just goes, oh, it's okay. <laughs> sure. But Pastor Bill and I are pretty strong in our passion for what we feel. But we never do anything till we get in agreement. Why? Because we are doers of the word. <laughs> and we, we discuss things pretty heatedly sometimes. But it doesn't change the fact that we do not let the sun go down on our wrath. Everybody say wrath. I'm talking about personal things here because these things happen in everybody's house. But when the shouting begins, somebody has to take a hold of the word and begin to get that thing straightened out and settle down real fast. When I first met Pastor Bill, when he's upset, he just likes to go to bed and not talk. When I'm upset, we're talking. <laughs> we are talking until somebody settles down and we get it together again. And so, you know, we've had to learn. Listen, it could be a long night if we don't find out how to fix this right now. We try to fix things immediately. Some things can't be fixed. I mean, we, we don't have the same opinion. We don't have the same we don't have the same revelation. We don't see it the same way. But I respect who he is. So if a decision has to be made, I am a doer of the word. Now, I'm not saying I'm just like smiling and praising Jesus. It might take me a minute. But I do what he thinks. Why? Because if he makes a mistake, it's his responsibility. I'm just along because the word said that he's the head of the house. Now, this is where we get a lot of marriage counseling calls. I said to my husband the other day, we'd have a marriage seminar, but those are a killer. I'm telling you, the phones start ringing immediately on Monday because everybody's in a situation. God is the author of peace. Everybody say peace. And to be a doer of the word, we have to find that place. You know, sometimes I'm talking about things that I don't even need to be concerned about. I have no responsibility to fix them. The Lord showed me when we were in the, since we've been in the ministry, and my husband has reminded me, if you don't have authority in that position, then keep your mouth shut and pray. Because only the people who have the authority can make the difference. We can talk all day about what's going on in our government, but we have to pray until God gives us an opportunity to make a change because we are not in authority making those decisions in that office. But there are people that are there that can influence that. So what Pastor Billy Joe used to say to us, you can't lead a horse to water, but you can salt their oats. So I believe we have power as the Holy Spirit leads us to correct things and to do things. But by all means, when I heard this, you know, this wasn't, I, I knew that it was going to be a firm word because God's been speaking to me firmer words, not for chastisement of what I'm doing, but to call me to a place of being more aware of what is being said and done around me. And I believe that's for every person in this church. If you're having situations, then get alone with God and say, where is the door that is open so I can get this thing shut? Because if not, deception will find your house. It will find your life. And it will, it will cause, maybe not today, but down the road, there will be consequences. It says in, in Galatians, and I don't mean this as I think it's a wake-up call that I needed. I don't take it as a bad message. I think we need to know what's going on, and God is telling us this is going on. This is going down right now in our nation and for the things around us. In Galatians, it talks about this. It's chapter 6, the very last chapter of that book, and it says, uh, do not be deceived. Everybody say, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will reap. For 
He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And then let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season, everybody say due season. I believe some of you need a due season. You, you need that season. You need to see it. We all have things that this is the season I need to see this. We will reap if we do not lose heart. It's very easy to look around at what's going on around us. And, and we can say what's going on in our nation, what changes are being made at the state level, uh, what's being decided right here in Lafayette, Indiana. They, they don't really affect me because I haven't noticed any change at my house. Well, if you notice, your gas has gone up. How many of you noticed that? Yeah. Uh, I'm in line at Sam's forever to get the cheapest gas. Why? Because I don't want to pay those prices. But that didn't just happen. That happened way back there. And so we have to become alert for the future to take care of today so when it's time for the right thing to happen, it will happen because the right people will be in place. Amen. I want us to pray that you can stand with me, and I'm going to pray for you that no deception will come near your dwelling place. A year ago for my birthday, I gave everybody the book Avoiding Deception. And um, I'm not throwing stones here because my husband gives me books, and I am not a book reader that much, but, um, and I have him who can, he told me, I'll highlight the book, you just read the highlights, that's all you need to know. So that's kind of the way I read, you know, I have him read it first. But uh, I do think it's a season where the Word of God needs to, to be number one in our reading material, but number two, that book, Avoiding Deception, if you still have it in your house, if you don't, you can let Sandy know as you leave today, and we will get you a copy of it. It's an excellent book, and if you read it, we are living that. I'm not saying we weren't living it last year, but we are in a, we've taken a step further in what's going on. I believe God is about to do something that is going to shake this world. Hebrews says there will be a shaking. He is a consuming fire. And so it's not that anything's going to happen to us, but we are responsible to be aware of what is happening around us. If you pray and like to pray, Sue, Bill, and others, I know Lisa's there, others come on Sunday night and, and they pray from 6 to 7. And they do pray for us, this church, the people in it, but they're also praying for that what's going on in our nation because ultimately it does trickle down. It will come to us. If it isn't here yet, it will come. And so we, as the body of Christ, the word of God says, if we're doers of the word, we pray for those in authority. I pray for all of you in authority in your home today that you will hear the voice of God. How many of you have young people, a couple of generations down, grandchildren, children that you, you're going to have to get in the gap here because there's some things that are going on in their lives that you're going to have to stand in between the devil and them and stand in that gap. We have a job to do no matter what our age, but I am particularly praying right now for young people because I believe they, they have been deceived by what they've watched, what they're around, who they're around, and because the world is so much darker, then the light has to get much, much brighter everywhere that we go. Father, I thank you today for every person here. I thank you. Could you put on some music back there for me? Um, I pray for every person here that the word of God that they have, Lord, you don't hold us accountable. The Bible says we're accountable for the word that we know, not, not, not what somebody else knows. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not accountable to, to be like Franklin Graham. I'm not, I'm not accountable to you to, to know what he knows and do what he do, does. I, I'm accountable to you for the word of God that is in my heart that I do on a regular basis. And I pray for every person in this room. It says in the word of God that we would have a hunger for righteousness, that the word of God, we would have a hunger to, for the word of God and the truth. Because if you're not a hearer, you'll never be a doer. But I thank you for the people in this room. I know most everybody, and I know them personally, and I know that we are doing what we know to do. 
but you may be listening online and, and you're not even in a church. You don't even know, you don't even have friends that are walking in the truth of the word of God. We're going to pray today. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to know where you're spending eternity. But more than even that, today is a day to know who walks with you right here in this world. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. I thank you for anybody listening, for anybody that maybe will pick up this message down the road, that, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is love, which is love, which is love and forgiveness and mercy, will, will touch their life. And that they will reach out for the, the answer to what they're facing in their life. I thank you, Lord, that for this church, we intercede. We pray for the lost. We are believing, Lord, for souls in this church, for people to come to a saving knowledge of God, to hear the word of God, to be fortified in their weak places, and to walk in the anointing that God has placed on their life. Because in John, First John, it says everybody has an anointing. So I thank you, Lord for delivering today those that may be watching or hearing this word, that if they need you and have never received you, right now as we pray, they will believe and they will look to you and confess this with their mouth. And the Bible says that you are faithful to save them right that moment and deliver them from all evil and forgive all their sins. In Jesus' name, let's pray together. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died for my sins. Thank you that I am saved, delivered, and healed, not because of my goodness, but because of your goodness, not because I do everything right, but because of your righteousness that I have through Christ Jesus. I ask you to forgive me for my sins and lead me in the way of truth and life. I give you my heart. I give you my, my mind. I thank you, Lord, that my mind will think like you. Led by the Holy Spirit, I will do and be all I'm called to be in Jesus' name. Now, I want us to pray and agree today for those who have, um, have been deceived. They're deceived. Right now, they are doing things that they don't need to do. I was talking to someone not very long ago. Well, they, they're all interested in the gambling thing that's now on the phones and on the television. So, you know what they exchange for whatever they used to do as a believer. Now they've decided gambling isn't all that bad. How many of you, gam gambling is a deception of the world? You know, the Powerball and all this stuff. You know, somebody said to me, don't you want to get that Powerball so you can pay for the church? Uh... No, but if whoever won the Powerball wants to tithe to the church, that'll be okay. We receive money from wherever it comes. Amen? But I'm not going to go buy a ticket because that is an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity for the devil to get a little place in my heart and build on that a mountain when it was a molehill. Amen? I see it, and I am in distress over what I am seeing in godly people that I know they love God. But that is Second Timothy. They have love for pleasure. They have love for other things. And they have abdicated that strong, firm stand that James is talking about. I'm sure in the church when James preached this, when James began to say this, it was because the church of Acts and the church had grown to a level where somebody had to step in and say, hold up. We are blessed to be a blessing, but that doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want to do. Amen? Father, I pray today for the young people, older people, whoever they are, that, were, that are Christians, they love God, but they have abdicated their position in the kingdom of God. They have stepped out of order. They have stepped into things that are now ensnaring them and will ensnare everyone associated with them that looks to them as a leader whether it's a father, whether it's a business leader, doesn't matter, Lord. 
I bind the devil over their life. I take authority over those situations. If you can think of somebody right now, begin to pray. Father, we put the word in action today over these situations, and we declare that those that are out there that have become deceived, we ask you, Lord, for something to open their eyes. Open the eyes and let them, as the word of God says, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Let them see what the Spirit of God sees. Let them begin to wake up before the enemy has an opportunity to destroy their lives. I thank you, Lord. The Word is true. The Word is working. The Holy Spirit is hovering still over all the lives of the people of this world. And I thank you for truth, truth, truth to begin to, to penetrate these lies of the devil, these fortresses of, of evil that have built themselves up we call them to, to come down in the name of Jesus. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You lies, you, you liar, you thief. We rebuke you and we loose. We bind his works and we loose the almighty power of God over every one of those situations. We call children home from wherever they're at. We tell them, come home. You come home first to God and then you come home to your family. You come home to those who love you. You stop running with that gang that isn't following Jesus. And we pray for that gang to get saved. We thank you, Lord, that the people of this earth will become aware that this is the hour and the time to begin to speak an ordained word from the truth of the word of God over their families, over their working established people in that working place. Some of you have people in your working place. If the trumpet sounded, they are going to be left here. If they died, they would go to hell. In Jesus' name, we are standing in the gap. No more devil. We are putting a line in the sand, and we are calling the lost into the light, into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, for the glory of God. And everybody who believed that said, amen. amen. And you still want to pray, go tonight at 6 o'clock. Where do you pray at? Over there. Over there. Well, somewhere. If you find the door that is unlocked. Okay, the kids area. Okay. Everybody say, I'm glad I came. Everybody say this, I am a doer of the word of God. I hear. I love to hear. And I love to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can go and be blessed. Amen.